Although not officially recognized and formally recognized yet by scientists, the Anthropocene is in wide use as a term both amongst scientists and in broader cultural debates as recognition that we've entered into a new epoch, a new geological epoch that is one that follows upon the Holocene that existed for uh, in the Earth's history for about the last 10,000 years. And the Anthropocene is characterized by um, an, a, a clear and, um, and distinct human signature on various Earth processes. And for our purposes, I think today, the most obvious version or the most obvious instance of this signature is the effect that human beings are having on the climate system. And um, we have now uh, concentrations of CO2 and um, methane in the atmosphere that are far exceed any of the average fluctuations of the previous Holocene. And climate change and the, and, the, and the disruptions that these concentrations will have to the climate system is just one example of the Anthropocene and the sort of challenge that it poses to humanity. It's probably worth saying that the Anthropocene is a product of, uh, or the, sort of the unintended product of a process that we all have reason to value, and this is this process of industrialization that's brought prosperity to so many, not everybody, but to so many. So I think the, um, the significant and one of the most important challenges for the Anthropocene, both for international relations and also for domestic government, uh, governments, is to think about how it is that we can achieve a greater level of human prosperity within the confines of sustainability and global justice. This is a big question, and it's a very important one, obviously. I think the first thing to, uh, to note is that we have to talk about this within the context of this idea of a carbon budget. And this, is very, and this is very important for thinking about policy and, and how geoengineering fits into this policy, uh, possibly fits into the, the suite of responses that we might have. Policy. And the, the basic idea is that the warming of the planet is driven by concentrations of CO2 and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And CO2 in particular, because it has such a long life within the atmosphere, the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere are a function of total historic CO2 emissions. So if we want to hit any particular temperature goal, say 2 degrees centigrade, if we want to hit any particular temperature goal, there's an associated cumulative CO2 emissions packet that we can't exceed, or budget that we can't exceed to hit that goal. Scientists think that it's somewhere on the order of, two tri of, a, of a trillion tons. And the problem, of course, for us is that we far, um, we're, we're far beyond the halfway point already um, for that trillion tons of CO2 emitted. <clears throat> and um, we haven't made yet any serious efforts to mitigate climate change to bring down our CO2 emissions. So within that context, people are beginning to talk about alternative solutions to, uh, to climate change that might complement mitigation. Mitigation is the reducing, in this context, think about mitigation as the reducing of CO2 emissions, bringing them eventually to a halt. We have to eventually reach zero CO2, CO2 or a net zero, to zero CO2 emissions in order to maintain a level of concentrations that will be associated with any particular temperature goal. One of the important things to think about in this context is that the vast majority of the intergovernmental, pan intergovernmental panel on climate change's um, estimates of, of reaching two degrees rely on a process of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Something like, something on the order of 87% of the models that the IPCC has explored to reach two degrees relies on this process of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. This is carbon dioxide removal, and it's one of the forms of geoengineering. It's controversial in part because we don't yet have the technology to do this. So we're, insofar as we're banking on a procedure that would help us or that would allow us to reach two, two degrees centigrade, and we don't have the technology yet to um, allow us to get there. Some people, many people worry that we're passing on a problem. Um, 10, 20 years down the road for which we don't yet have an answer. The other, um, the other form of geoengineering that gets the most discussion is called solar radiation management, as you mentioned. And solar radiation management would involve, typically, it, there's, there are many different forms of solar radiation management, but typically in the most controversial and the most widely discussed version of solar radiation management involves shooting some sort of aerosol, aerosol particle into the stratosphere in order to block some of the sun's solar radiation. And one of the ways in which these two technologies might be used in complement with one another is, is in an effort to buy time to reach, say, the two-degree target. Solar radiation management might be used to 
um, deflects some of the sun's solar rays, and at the same time, CO2 might be, um, might be taken out of the atmosphere. And uh, in concurrently with all of that, we might pursue a policy of mitigation to try to bring our emissions down to zero. The worry, of course, with solar radiation management, there are many worries, but one of the worries with solar radiation management is of course, that this also is not well understood and well tested, and there are concerns that we're manipulating the atmosphere on a global scale. Some people think of this as a version of playing God, for example. In my opinion, um, the, the verdict is still out on, on both forms of these technologies, although I think it's going to be hard for us to achieve a two-degree goal without using at least carbon dioxide removal. So, that strikes me as a, as, a, as a far less controversial option. But with respect to solar radiation management, if it's the case that it turns out that we aren't able to hit the two degree goal um, via mitigation and carbon dioxide removal alone, then I think we have difficult questions to ask that it's not clear to me that we can answer simply by condemning solar radiation management. For example, if we were to put tremendous pressure on developing countries to mitigate their climate change there, to, to cut their carbon dioxide emissions and such pressure that um, it would cause them to have to forego or retard their development objectives, objectives, then it strikes me that that's a very high cost to pay in the pursuit of the two degree goal and it might be worth considering the use of solar radiation management in order to ease those sorts of pressures. Mm -hmm.